I've also got with me um, John uh, Rees, who is uh, one of the organizers of this march. John, very nice to meet you here today. Last week was a massive demonstration, a huge amount of people turned up. What are you trying to achieve today and this week? Well, I think we're at an absolutely vital turning point in events at the moment. We can see that the Israeli army is poised on the edge of a ground invasion of Gaza. And of course, everybody knows that will be an invasion against a largely unarmed civilian population and the death toll will be enormous if that happens. So you only have to look at the disproportion uh, in armaments. Hamas arrives with gliders and motorbikes. These people will arrive with F-16s, a whole air force of F-16s and Merkava tanks and that will be a disaster uh, for Gaza. But it's more serious even than that because we're now beginning to understand that the Israeli plan is to drive perhaps a million Gazans over the Rafa crossing and into Sinai. Now, what's waiting them in Sinai? Well, the Egyptian state is already at war with a thousand ISIS fighters in Sinai. So the Israeli plan is to smash Hamas, drive a million Palestinians into the arms of a thousand already fighting ISIS fighters. This will be a disaster like Iraq for the second time. Well, you, you mentioned Iraq there, and that was going to be my question. We had huge demonstrations 20 years ago against the invasion of Iraq, which everybody now, now agrees was a disaster for the world, for the international community, and for Iraqis in particular. In terms of today's demonstration, some people will argue that, hold on, is this the right thing to do, the right approach, because they're still going to go and do what they want to do. What's your riposte to, that, to those people? I think this has got a lot of road to run. If you listen carefully to the tone in the news, in the mainstream news bulletins and to what the politicians are saying, if you look at the Cairo Peace Conference today, the fact that some tiny amount of aid has gone through the Rafa uh, crossing, they're beginning to get cold feet. They're beginning to worry about what it will mean for Hezbollah. I mean, this week, Houthis in Yemen fired cruise missiles at Israel that was only brought down by an American ship in the Red Sea. Now, even the idiots in charge of this can see that this would likely start a Middle East conflagration. So they're beginning to worry, they're beginning to try and pull back. Our business is to make sure that they pull back as far as we can make them pull back, if not actually stop, and to say to them, look, you saw the opinion poll. 76% of people in this country want an immediate ceasefire. The political system in this country is going to be damaged by this just as it was damaged by Iraq if you don't listen to those people. And in terms of the, the, the government, we've seen a huge show of support and solidarity with Israel. Um, uh, the Prime Minister was there in Tel Aviv and he said, we hope that you will win to Benjamin Netanyahu. What does winning look like? I mean, and, and how do you feel about these comments uh, in relation to the leader of this country and also President Biden saying that we stand shoulder and shoulder with the Israelis. Look, Rishi Sunak is a silly little rich boy who's never been elected in this country and won't be elected at the next general election. Yeah, he's just, he's just playing for time until the election comes and he's kicked out by the electorate. Look what happened in two safe seats this week for the Tories. They got utterly hammered. So Rishi Sunak's authority as leader of this country is frankly close to zero. All he's doing is what the British Prime Minister have done since time immemorial, run after the Americans and the Americans control the Israelis and that's how it works. Now in terms of, you've touched on politics in this country, we've seen this week uh, the leader of the opposition Keir Starmer trying to roll back on his comments, uh, especially in relation to the, to the siege of Gaza, the civilians. And a lot of Labour Party politicians, councillors have been resigning and saying we can't stay in this anymore. A lot are, are, are supposedly afraid um, uh, to attend marches or speak on demonstrations. What's the reaction to that? I mean, should um, speech like this or people's opinions um, be, be curtailed like this? I mean, and what do you, what's your message to those politicians who, who perhaps may be thinking that this is not in my name? Well, the tide's already beginning to turn. You, you know, last week's demonstration, only Jeremy Corbyn spoke. He was the only MP that spoke. No Labour MP spoke. There'll be five Labour MPs speaking on this demonstration. There'll be six General Secretaries of Unions. And what that tells you is, last week's demonstration was a game changer. It was so big and so confident 
that now the more establishment politicians are saying, OK, we can't stand away from this. For Starmer, it's very, very simple. Iraq ruined Tony Blair's reputation. Palestine will ruin Starmer's reputation. He's got, as you say, tranches, not just of councillors, but of the people who hold together the entirety of Oxford Labour Party's leadership just resigned in a single evening. Now, there's only one thing that could lose Starmer in the next election, and that's if he so destroys his own base that he hasn't got the troops on the ground. If I was him, I would start, well, he already is, withdrawing those comments, backpedalling. I mean, it's pathetic, but hey. And in terms of the Home Secretary, um, uh, making insinuations that this was a, uh, a sea of hate or uh, a gathering of uh, supporters of a particular militant group. What's your repost to that? Because uh, looking at the marches behind me, and I can see it objectively myself, that this is all about Palestinians and Palestine. We've heard this so many times, and those of us that were involved in uh, the marches uh, against the Iraq and Afghan wars, we heard all this then. They will do anything to demonise and denigrate ordinary people when they take their affairs into their own hands. Now, for me, the best thing about this society is when ordinary people begin to take things into their own hands. The ordinary people of this country are so much better than their government. And when they move like this, every government, every party, every political organisation has to take notice. And a final question, because I know you're really busy trying to organise this. In terms of what happens afterwards, in terms of civil society and its uh, response uh, in this country, could you just let our viewers know, especially those in the UK, what's taking place, how they can get involved, uh, and, and how Stop the War will be mobilising in the future? Yeah, I mean, please, if you aren't already on the mailing list for the Palestine Solidarity Campaign and the Stop the War uh, Coalition, do get there, because organisation is what counts. You know, in the end, ordinary people only have two advantages over those with power. We don't have money, we don't have guns, we don't have the courts or the media, but we do have numbers and we do have organisation. But even the numbers aren't any good without the organisation. So the lesson is, get organised, get active and make a difference. Well, thank you so much, John, and we appreciate that. And we'll hope to speak to you later on, perhaps towards the end.